Namaskara and welcome to BIC Talks, a podcast brought to you by Bangalore International Centre, where we present conversations that move, inform and encourage discourse. Uh, so what Devdhar does is he addresses the orthodox argument and he says that, you know, divorce is not adharmic or against religion. He says that if we look closely at Hindu texts, history and contemporary needs, you will actually see nothing scary or anti-Hindu. He translates a verse from Manusmriti that lays out the conditions under which a woman can remarry. After the death of a husband, if the husband seeks sannyas, meaning leaving home, and worldly society in search of spiritual growth, or if the husband is impotent. He notes that if the ancient sage Manu had laid out scenarios where a wife could take a new husband while the first was still alive, then clearly he did sanction divorce. Divorce has been typically framed in Indian popular culture as available mainly to upper-class urban and anglicized people with the financial means to pursue long-winded remedies in court. In addition, Hindus have had specific obstacles to accessing divorce. Among the various religion-based personal law systems, Hindu personal law was the last to legalize divorce. Critics have long framed divorce as anti-Hindu and a practice promoted by frivolous, westernized women. Escaping unwanted or abusive marriages has therefore been an uphill battle. What arguments did early proponents of divorce in the mid-20th century use to legalize divorce? How did they seek to show its acceptance in Shastras? Author and professor at George Washington University, Ashwini Tambe, pursues these questions in this talk by looking closely at Marathi public culture and specifically the longest-running Marathi women's magazine, Stri. She shares translated content from Stri, excerpts of letters to the editor, legal advice and opinion pieces to describe the arguments that facilitated the stronger social acceptance of divorce. I'm a professor of women's gender and sexuality studies and history at George Washington University. And my work is about the relationship between law and sexuality. And a couple of years ago, while I was uh, looking at the content of this magazine called Stri, which is the longest running magazine in the, um, the women's, longest running women's magazine in uh, Marathi, I was surprised to see a lot of content about divorce. And that's what got me interested in the topic that I'm about to speak about today. Um, I'm gonna begin with an introduction that has been circulated. Um, so divorce, has typically been framed in Indian popular culture as available primarily to upper-class, anglicized, urban people who have the financial means and the cultural capital to pursue long-winded remedies in courts. Critics of divorce have long framed it as anti-Hindu and a practice that is promoted by frivolous, westernized women. As a result, escaping unwanted or abusive marriages has been an uphill battle for many Hindu women. Among the various Indian personal law systems based on religion, Hindu personal law, interestingly, was the last to legalize divorce. Divorce was ruled possible for Parsis after the Parsi Marriage Act, uh, Marriage and Divorce Act of 1865, for Christians in 1869 with the Indian Divorce Act, and for Muslims, after the dissolution of Muslim Marriage Act in 1939. For Hindus, the legal right to divorce was formalized in 1955. So that's why my topic uh, and the title focuses on Hindu divorce, because the period that I look at, the 1930s and 40s, was a time when divorce was actually available for women of other religious backgrounds, but not for Hindu women. So what I'm trying to do in today's talk is share with you some of the justifications that were used that specifically dealt with access to divorce for Hindu women. The question I have today is what arguments did the early proponents of divorce in this period, the mid 20th century, use um, to legalize divorce? And specifically, how did they seek to show acceptance for divorce in the Shastras? I pursue these questions by looking specifically at Marathi public culture and this magazine's three. 
And I'm going to share a lot of stories, a lot of translated content, um, excerpts from letters to the editor, legal advice, opinion pieces, um, all of which give you a sense of um, this particular moment in history. Now, why look at Marathi public culture? Um, it's important because a significant number of reformists and legislators who helped formalize Hindu women's legal right to divorce at a national level, such as Chimnabai Gaikwad, Dr. Gopal Ravi Deshmukh, and Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, were Marathi. Bombay Presidency and Baroda, which was at that time ruled by uh, Marathas, legalized divorce for Hindu women before the country as a whole did so. So by looking at ideas that were circulating in the Marathi public sphere, I'm trying to trace the itinerary of reformist ideas about uh, divorce that gained prominence in the 1940s and then led to the national level uh, legalization of divorce for Hindu women um, in 1955. So a few words about the source that I'm focusing on. Stri was founded in 1930 as a magazine focused on women, and it quickly became the largest circulating magazine of its kind in its first four decades. The magazine was not explicitly political. Its content was entertainment oriented and pitched at multiple generations. It included short fiction written by prominent authors. It included reports and opinions on news events, memoirs and travel writing, advice on domestic matters, fashion, poetry, letters from editors, I mean from readers. And the readers were neither necessarily anglicized nor wealthy. They were members of middle class, upper caste families whose women had access to education, but were typically educated in schools where Marathi was the medium of instruction. So let me just share some slides of covers from this magazine. So these two are among the earliest covers. And one of the interesting things you'll see if you go and look at the archive of the magazine is that many of the cover images often depict women reading because part of what they were trying to do is also promote literacy for women. The magazine also very quickly <clears throat> popularized the romantic couple. So here are some examples of covers that convey domestic bliss, a kind of partnership between husbands and wives, you often find women uh, portrayed in a kind of um, leading role. You notice that she's holding a book in her hand, and you'll see women holding books in the most unlikely places, outdoors as well. Stree's cover images popularized the romantic couple at this time. So what really fascinated me was that this was a magazine that also carried content abo about divorce, you know, advocating access to divorce, even as it explicitly celebrated companionate marriage. At first glance, this may seem contradictory. However, both the content about romantic bliss and about the right to divorce concurrently signaled the realignment of the idea of marriage from treating it as a bond between two families to now treating it as a bond between two individuals whose primary goal was companionship. Three content seems to suggest that if a companionate marriage was not possible, then divorce was justifiable. Now, of course, for many three readers, the prospect of divorce was quite alien. There was very little information about it, about its legal standing, and there were very few examples of real people who had undergone divorce. However, the magazine's contents show that there was a lot of appetite for this information. You may ask, is this an aberration? Is it just this particular magazine that had this particular tilt? But I found that that wasn't the case. If you look at the early 1930s literary context, there was a lot of emphasis on freedom in interpersonal relationships. Many Marathi thinkers and writers, including um, legislators such as Vivi Zoshi, the sociologist M.D. Altekar, raised topics such as the necessity of the dissolution of marriage, women's economic independence, intercaste marriage, and they were all committed to the idea of freedom in intimate relationships as part of the general spirit of human freedom in all fields um, that was you know, pervading the cause of political independence from Britain at this time. I turned my attention to the topic of divorce in the mid 20th century because I was intrigued by how bold the proposals related to divorce uh, uh, in this period were. Um, this was well before 
divorce had actually become legal. And so I'm really struck by how much people are thinking about it and writing about it. So in this talk, I'm going to share stories. I'm going to share translated excerpts of content from this magazine that show how divorce was being imagined and discussed 15 years or so before it actually became legal or legally available for Hindu women. This was with the passing of the Hindu Marriage Act in 1955. And many of the translations are my own. Now, three articles offer a sense of how proponents of divorce sought to indigenize this practice by distinguishing it from what they per perceived as Western excess. One of the most frequently used tropes um, uh, by critics of divorce was that of a flighty Western woman who was just given to being frivolous and just asked for divorce at the drop of a hat. And so anyone who was a proponent of divorce in this period um, uh, had to, was burdened with refusing this association with Western women. Now, among upper caste Hindus, the received sense was that Hinduism and specifically Vedic Shastras treated marriage as an indissoluble sacrament. Although scholars had offered counterexamples of flexibility in the marriage bond, uh, using examples from Narada, Manu, and Kautilya about conditions for dissolving a marriage, orthodox pundits at the time ruled that Hindu rituals uh, treated marriage as a sacred bond. Now, in practice, norms among lower caste communities were actually much more flexible. Customary forms of separation were available among Marathas. It was called Kadi Mod, which translates as breaking of a twig. It was also available to Lingayats in this region and the Moshudras in um, Bengal. When Dr. Ambedkar, as law and justice minister in 1949, argued in favor of codifying divorce in the Hindu Code Bill, he actually argued that divorce was already being practiced as a custom among the lower caste majority and so it should have been a no-brainer to legalize it. However, customary se separation did actually vary from region to region, and the standards of proof used uh, varied as well. And most importantly, they typically didn't allow women to leave intolerable situations without the consent of the husband. Among Marathas, for instance, the husband had to grant something called a sword chitti, uh, which means a departure note or a note that allows you to leave, which confirmed that he agreed to it. Sometimes a divorced wife had to pay a fine to the caste panchayat. What was being proposed then in this period that I'm looking at was a new pan-caste legal standard for divorce. And a new Marathi term was also circulating called ghatasphot, which means breaking of a pot. Instead of the practice of kadi mod or the sword chitti or also something called farkat ghene, which means separation, reformists were proposing ghatasphot divorce, a new standardized legal right that was distinct from various customs and that applied to all castes. It's likely that they found its aura as a modern legal category um, that women could use uh, preferable to the existing forms of separation, where men often initiated the separation. What is also evident in Sri is a real struggle uh, between advocating for the right to ghatasphot and refusing associations with um, westernization. Opinion writers, as you will see, um, go to great lengths to caricature Anglo-American women. And the letters to editors are also at pains to show, portray women whose identities appear authentically Indian or domestic and that are not informed by Western ideas. Whenever any reference to marital practices in the Anglo-American world come up, they're almost always negative. So there were three kinds of sources. Um, these are what, this, this is what I'm going to be looking at. First, opinion pieces, then letters to the editor. And under opinion pieces, I'm including women's movement texts, letters to the editor, and legal advice columns. Opinion pieces often mounted arguments that were sociological, and they laid out scriptural discussions. Perhaps more effective were first-person letters from readers. They offered moving narratives of miserable marriages, and they were using a sentimental appeal. Apart from appeals to the sympathy of readers, Sri also shared advice about the neighboring jurisdiction of Baroda, which did make divorce available in the 1930s. Many readers were unfamiliar with it, but they were curious about it. 
And their questions illustrate what legal scholars such as Lauren Benton and Mitra Sharafi have called legal forum shopping, where people actually looked for whatever jurisdiction had the least resistance to whatever it is that they wanted to get. A quick note also on the education levels of the readers. I found a survey in the magazine in conducted in 1955 that received 500 responses that gives us a sense of the literacy levels in the households um, that received this magazine. About 20% were graduates of colleges, 20% had passed Marathi high school final exam, and 25% had given up their education at various points, whether in middle school or high school. And the rest reported um, even less access to education. Half of them were married and lived in conjugal households, um, of which 41% were joint families. Uh, when it comes to caste, you can see that the authors featured in three were often drawn from upper castes, and I guess this based on last names. But the readership also did draw from non-Brahmin rural elites, as you can see from some letters to editors. And the relationship between non-Brahmin rural elites and upper caste progressive um, the literati was a really complex one. When it comes to this topic, there was actually quite a bit of ideological overlap uh, because both believed in rejecting traditional worldviews, rituals, superstitions, and adopting rationalist mindsets. So as Rahul Sarwate has argued, rural elites, lower caste activists, and upper caste progressives, in some respects, did share ideas that were typical of modernist, nationalist um, ideas of the time, discourses of this time. The, the focus was on improving people's minds and rejecting traditions. So the first foray in three into promoting divorce, this was an opinion piece titled Bandhamukta Ghatasfot, and it was in the very second year of the magazine's publication, and it was by someone called Sharada Bai Chitare, who went on to become a Montessori educator in Bombay City. And it presents a really heartfelt personal engagement with a novel that had just come out the previous year called Bandhamukta, and that translates as freedom from chains or unconstrained. And in this novel, the protagonist, a woman, initiated a divorce. Chitrale explains that she was invited by the editor to offer her views about this novel. And she says that even though, you know, prior to reading this novel, she had no strong views on divorce, she found that the story that Bombay Wale told was so moving that she felt that she was now on the side of the protagonist who wanted a divorce. Uh, Chitrale argues that when people realize that marriage is not a God-given tie, or a Parmeshwar Nirmit Bandhan, but a social agreement, a Samajik Pavitra Karar, they will abandon the notion that a woman must work in her husband's house for her livelihood all her life. Now, she does acknowledge at one point that she might sound overly westernized. So she then says, I'm not arguing for frivolous Western style practices. I'm just saying that couples should be given the option to separate and then see if they want to ask for a divorce. A year later, Sri published an article by religion scholar Gangadhar Lakshman Devdhar that was much more strong in its advocacy for divorce. Devdhar articulates a vision of how divorce was justified by Hindu shastras. The context is that he's uh, responding to um, the, Hindu the, the news that the Hindu marriage dissolution bill had failed in the Central Legislative Assembly, and it had been defeated by those who decried it as anti-Hindu. He, this is 1932, okay, so for those of you who are wondering why it is that Hindu law took so long to uh, make divorce available when Muslims, Christians, and Parsis had divorce available, there were attempts like this, but they were defeated in the legislative process by those who said this practice is anti-Hindu. Uh, so what Devdhar does is he addresses the orthodox argument, and he says that, you know, divorce is not adharmic or against religion. He says that if we look closely at Hindu texts, history and contemporary needs, you will actually see nothing scary or anti-Hindu. He translates a verse from Manusmriti that lays out the conditions under which a woman can remarry. After the death of a husband, if the husband seeks sannyas, meaning leaving home and worldly society in search of spiritual growth, he notes that if the ancient sage Manu had laid out scenarios where a wife could take a new husband while the first was still alive, then clearly he did sanction divorce. 
Devdhar also reminds readers that when the practice of sati had been banned in the previous century, similar protests had declared that the religion was in trouble, that Hinduism was drowning. But now, he says, subsequent generations had seen the wisdom in that ban. He then goes on to use the rhetorical strategy of caricaturing foreign places, and by implication, Anglo-Western countries. There, he argues, women seek divorce for really frivol frivolous reasons, such as if the husband's weight increases, or if he does not stick to an agreed number of daily kisses. I found that extremely interesting, daily kisses. <laughs> the courts, he notes, grant women such divorces uh, for such reasons. And he states that such practices do undermine social stability. However, he mocks them, and what he's doing is he's presenting his own views as relatively reasonable. He also denounces the customary form of separation um, called Kadi Mordne, and he says that is actually potentially threatening to Hindu society because it is too easily available. So what Devdar does is he focuses on articulating a new and limited legal right that is distinct from existing customs. And by leaning on authoritative um, Hindu sources or scriptures, uh, he mounts a more conservative uh, case for divorce. A more radical case for women's right to divorce appears in the pages of Sri in the following year, in April 1933, uh, with the Marathi translation of a manifesto produced by the All India Women's Conference um, on the heels of the Lucknow meeting of this organization. Those of you who are familiar with women's history know this, that this was one of the major pan-Indian women's organizations. It consisted of representatives from across the country, and its goal was to promote women's welfare and education, and it held annual conferences. So after its 1931 conference, um, it published uh, a, a manifesto, and that manifesto was translated and republished in three um, and, it was and, it and its title was Bharatiya Sri Jahir Nama, or Indian Women's Manifesto. And, you know, those who are also in the field of women's history as I am, often think of AIWC as a, you know, a gathering of largely elite women. So it's interesting when you look at the actual demands, um, the manifesto covers several realms of independence and freedom, and it focuses on econo economic independence as the primary goal, followed by overcoming gender segregation and access to education. Significantly, one of the rights that it uh, calls for is divorce on demand. And it's presented as part of a list of other core demands. These are the things that they believe all women need to have in order to achieve their rightful place in society. So alongside equal opportunity in employment, equal wages for equal work, right to abortion and medical care, the right to vote, it also puts divorce as a core demand. A more granular justification for um, legalizing divorce appears in another opinion piece in 1943. And this is an article written by Chandrakala Hate, who's a feminist sociologist. And she's, you know, she uses this illustration that shows couples who are, or a husband and wife who are literally tied to one another but are walking in opposite directions. She sees a lot of unhappiness couple, among couples. And she notes that people often wonder why such couples are even together. And she says that when they're asked that, they say, Brahma tied are not. Now, although this may sound like a generic expression of fatalism, it also actually evokes the term Brahma Vivaha, which was a reference to a particular kind of marriage, the marriage that is arranged by parents. Such couples needed courage, Hati argued, to be able to break free from bad situations. Hati's greatest concern was about husbands who took second wives, and she offers a detailed account of how men's bigamy is destroying families. At the time, the BN Rao committee was focused on outlawing bigamy, but what she says is that it's not enough to outlaw bigamy. Wives must also be able to access legal divorce. If husbands have been allowed to take second wives, then first wives should be allowed the right to divorce them. So these four opinion pieces show the range of varying positions. Chitale, who's speaking in the first person, she's talking about a fictional divorce, and she's tentatively saying, you know, this looks like a good idea. Then you have Devdhar's Hindu scriptural rationalization. And then you have the All India Women's uh, Conference's radical justification for the necessity of divorce. 
And then you have Hate's very concrete focus on the conditions under which second wives live. But I, for me, what was most poignant, more poignant than these opinion pieces were the letters to the editor. Um, unlike the opinion pieces that I've just described, um, these were direct pleas for help. In the third year of its publications, three began a forum that focused on readers called Mazhe Vaivahid Jeevan, which means My Married Life. And the editor said that the mission of this particular part of the journal was, or the magazine was, laying out with openness the real face of married life. So Mazhe Vaivahid Jeevan, and then the second section that also focused on letters from readers was called Parityaktanse Prashna. So this is questions from deserted women or abandoned women. The letters that arrived in this series depict extremely challenging situations. So in one letter, a woman uh, who calls herself Sau Durdevi Rangu, or Mrs. Unfortunate Rangu, finds herself in a joint household who is uh, condemned to doing housework constantly, harassed by her in-laws, seeking an education, prevented from doing so, and married to a man who just, who sleeps, she says, day and night, and spends most of his time with friends and has a mountain of debt. Another letter by a newly wedded wife says that she's been insulted and treated as a simpleton by the family that she's married into. When she went to her natal home to deliver her first baby, she was not invited back by her husband's family and he went on to marry a second wife. And so in both these cases, the writers are beseeching the editors and the readers to think of divorce as a solution to their problems. The, the second letter closes by saying, uh, when divorce dawns, that will truly be a good day. So men left their first wives and remarried so often that there was actually this term, parityakta, uh, for abandoned or deserted women. The letters that, were, uh, that came in on this particular topic were also quite moving. So one letter from Ma February 1936 is the narrative of a woman who is, was born into a wealthy family and whose family thought it was a good match. Uh, but when she joined their household, she found herself harassed. Her husband had a law degree, but he sought no actual work at the courts. He used to just go in the mornings and come back in the middle of the day to play cards. And then he ultimately had an affair with another woman. Some situations are clearly intended to arouse outrage. So an, a letter from December 17th, uh, 7th, 1937, details a case of extortion. A woman who, would, who was betrothed to a man, but did not actually live with him, went on to complete her medical degree and worked as a doctor, but then once she started earning money, was visited on a regular basis by this man who demanded money from her for all kinds of reasons, including the wedding of the daughter he had from his second marriage. She explained that she got married at a young age in order to fulfill the dying wish of her mother because her mother's views were old fashioned. And her father then requested a delay in joining her marital family until she finished her matriculation exams. However, the in-laws demanded that she not do the exams because the husband had only studied until the third standard and they didn't want his wife to be more educated than him. The letter writer then says she refused to join the family. Her family approached the community court, the punch of their caste to adjudicate and the punch gathered and gave their permission to the man that she was betrothed to, to marry someone else. And so he went on then to have seven children with that, with the second person. The letter writer herself then went on to complete her medical education. She got not only an MBBS, but also an FRCS in Britain. And now she was working in a women's hospital and she had a salary of 700 rupees per month. But after her husband found out about her job, he began to harass her and constantly claimed that his own financial situation was fragile. At first, she sent small sums of money, but now he had started to come up, come to the bungalow every, every, a few times every year, demanding larger and larger sums, or else threatening to announce to everyone that he was her husband. So she was writing to the magazine, saying she needed a divorce, not because she wanted to marry again, because she said she was too old to do so, but simply because she didn't want other women to suffer as much as she did. 
another collection of letters also uses similar sort of, uh, sorts of examples of personal tragedies, but they're uh, less privileged in, uh, individuals. And this is the series called Mismatched Couples that's published between 1939 and 1942. One letter from Fe February 11th, 1941, describes a woman who was forced to marry at the age of 12 or 13, a man with mental illness. She describes herself as a village girl who learned to read and write at the age of five. And she drew inspiration from the many texts that she read. So she says, I always thought that like heroines such as Sita, Damayanti, Rukmini, and Subhadra, I should be able to choose my own husband. Unfortunately, though, her, hus her father insisted on mar her marrying a wealthy man because he wanted to make a respectable lady of her. She says, he did his duty, but I fell into an ocean of sorrow. Her groom turned out to be not good looking, not educated, to have addictions, and then he became mentally ill. Her father initially paid for the mental health treatment, brought him to his house, thinking that the supervision would help but nonetheless, the groom remained physically, mentally weak, intellectually dull, now I'm quoting her, unstable, unable to trust others, and un uninterested in everything. The, when he overheard her declaring to her father that she was not going to join uh, him, meaning her groom, in his home, and the father replying that he would not force her to do it against her wishes, the groom left the house, left town without informing anyone. So now the girl was at her father's house with no hopes of, education, of receiving the education that her father was providing to her brothers. And she says all that she receives is food and two saris a year. So she asks, I know that I've come to know that it's possible to get a divorce in Baroda. Could I get a divorce there? She then says that if she cannot get a divorce, her only option is to join a residential school for orphan girls. And she asked the editor, please send me a letter of reference because then I can go to an orphan girl's school. While the desperation in her voice is clear, what is also notable in this story is her dream of being in a position to choose her own groom and her spirited insistence that she not be sent to live with her betrothed. Also, it's significant that she lists the groom's physical appearance among her complaints and not just his intellectual and emotional challenges. The next letter is from the 26th of February, 1942. It's written by a woman whose marriage at age 15 also took place against her wishes to a man who was in his 50s who had a first wife and a daughter. This situation torments her. Uh, she notes that he comes from a wealthy family, and this means that there are more controls over her movement and her thoughts. And she complains, I'm aware that Hindu scriptures have left no other recourse than killing oneself to be free from such suffering. And she reflects on the nature of justice. She says, an unjust action gets support even from learned and balanced men. But if someone takes a step that is just, there is such a hullabaloo about morality, religion, and culture. The best way to get out of this situation is a divorce. But that will be the day when this law is applicable to the whole of India. And that, there she's referring to the current law in Baroda. The third letter that Zoshi presents is from a school teacher whose friend discovered a few days before, or after um, her, the wedding that her husband had three or four girlfriends. So this woman left him and, saying, and said to him, well, you don't need a wife. And she returned to her natal home. Her father passed away from shock a few days after that. And then she was burdened with educating her brothers. Because of that, she worked at a school and she used her economic responsibilities as a, an excuse to explain to the world why she lived apart from her husband. But um, as her friend describes it, she now became a serious person who did not smile again. So the friend asks the editor, some say a law of divorce has been passed in Baroda. If my friend spends a few days in Baroda, could she, get a, she could get a divorce. How many days must she spend there? Does she have to buy property there? How much will it cost her? So Raja Ratna Zoshi, the person who had compiled many of these letters, doesn't offer legal advice in response because he's not a lawyer, he's a novelist. 
But these letters are important from the perspective of legal history because of the specific queries about Baroda. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, Baroda was run by an unusually progressive uh, royal family, the Gayakwards, who led the modernization, uh, who led modernization efforts in many realms, and they were the first in the country to make divorce legal in 1931, primarily because of the efforts of Maharani Chimna Bai Gayakwad, who was also the first president of the All India Women's Conference. Stri did also run a column called Legal Advice or Kaidya Tsatsalla from early in its publishing history. Now, unlike the letters to the editor that I have just shared with you that give us a lot of different detailed narratives and life stories of those who are seeking a divorce, this column had a more focused set of questions. So these questions give us a sense of the concerns that readers had. So for example, in April 1942, this is a time when Bombay had not yet legalized formal divorces. This column is explaining how customs such as Farkat Ghene or the Sword Jitti work. A, a letter writer explains that in her agricultural community, men were allowed to leave their wives and take a second wife following a custom called Farkat. And her husband did that because she refused to give up her job working in her school. So the husband now had a second wife and a second family. So when her father approached the man to issue a sword chitti to allow her to proceed with her own life, the man refused and he asked um, for 700 rupees. In response, the lawyer who is offering uh, legal advice says that customs such as these um, are allowed in some castes, but these customs have not been formalized in the law, so the man cannot be compelled to issue a sword chitti. So the family is at the mercy of his demands for money. Until he does issue a sword chitti, his rights as a husband stay in place. The advisor observes that sometimes desperate women issue notices in the newspapers or get notarized letters sent by registered mail to their husbands, declaring that since they have not lived with their husband for a long time, he no longer holds rights over them. The legal advisor, however, cautions that such unilateral declarations of separation from one side actually cannot hold up before the law, and that if the woman proceeds to marry after such a declaration, she could actually be accused of engaging in an extramarital affair. There is one additional legal angle that the legal advisor also offers. The advisor says that because the woman is legally married to her husband, she actually can still seek spousal support or maintenance or potangi from him. And if the man earns enough to be able to pay for it, it is something that she can rightfully seek. And finally, uh, here are a few shorter examples of questions and answers from the legal advice column. And what I found really interesting about these questions and answers was how sobering they were. Um, you know, there is a lot of advice that's available. And at this point, it's August 48, right after divorce has become legally available in Bombay. That happened in 1947. And there's a flood of curious questions sent to the magazine about what this new legal change means. So here are some examples. My marriage took place against my mill, will and I have only completed college until interyear and I do not like my husband. I want to continue studying. Can I seek a divorce? The response, no. One cannot ask for a divorce simply because one doesn't like the spouse. Incompatibility is not a valid reason, it wasn't a reason under the Bombay 1947 law. Then, I don't have the, con this is a man writing, I don't have the consent of my first wife for my second marriage. Can I remarry? Short answer, you cannot. <laughs> then, I married outside my caste and my caste panchayat will not acknowledge the marriage and wants me to pay a 250 rupee fine. What kind of help can you offer? The response, congratulations on marrying outside your caste, but our society has not yet become enlightened. We'll need to change attitudes and effectively it says that you know, you won't be able to, um, if, you're, if you're doing it according to the rules of the caste panchayat, you'll have to follow those rules. So the, uh, one more example is a, a longer narrative. This is a girl who was married at the age of 11 or 12, and she's narrating what happened. She says, I threw off my wedding garland in the middle of the ceremony. That's how opposed I was to the whole thing. And then she says, a while later, the husband's family quarreled with my family. My mother-in-law beat me. 
I miscarried my baby during childbirth. I fell ill. Nobody helped me in those two years. I took a nursing maternity health course. My husband is a farmer and lives with his parents and he's dominated by his parents. I cannot live in the village and I cannot agree with his uneducated views. I have started a nursing home. Now my husband wants to bring me back to the village. I've asked for a sword chitti. They are asking for rupees 2000 a month from me. And I have my son with me. Can they do this? Now for this, he said, no, they cannot ask for payment for a uh, sword chitti. So moving on to the conclusion. So these letters, articles, opinion pieces, made for very moving reading for me. They conveyed the voices of people who are struggling with sometimes impossible dilemmas. Whereas the magazine's editor's imperative may have been to produce entertaining reading, and that's why they may have chosen letters that were more likely to prompt outrage, uh, it's clear that there were persistent patterns in the letters that were being sent to this magazine. And so we can conclude that there is a pattern or a set of common challenges that were shared uh, by women. So stepping back from these articles and letters, what is the portrait that emerges of Indian women who are seeking divorce or Hindu women who are seeking divorce? I see an archetype forming, that of a woman whose marriage is arranged against her will at an early age, who then discovers upon joining her conjugal family that her husband has serious problems but then she's prevented from leaving because of social taboos or because the conjugal family is predatory and seeking money in exchange for her freedom. Many women were also being forced to become second wives against their wishes. For them, all of these women, the option of seeking divorce through the law, even in a neighboring princely state of Baroda, came as a truly welcome relief. It is relevant then in retrospect that the key, a key feature of the Hindu Marriage Act that was passed in 1955 was its creation of a, of a matrimonial offense called cruelty. And this was added as a justification for divorce, apart from the mental instability of a partner or um, adultery or bigamy by the partner or religious conversion. The legal system recognized cruelty as a possibility in the way that the institution of arranged marriage worked at the time. So what do we make of this, this sort of emphasis on cruel scenarios? So when I was stepping back, you know, it struck me that so many of the stories that were told in um, accounts advocating for divorce um, you know, used egregious or worst case scenarios those that even the most hard-hearted readers had to sympathize with. Effectively though, Stri and the content that I've shared with you was setting quite a high bar for being able to claim divorce, right? So those who may have wanted to divorce for other reasons, for a variety of reasons, weren't able to access it because allowing for divorce only under um, conditions that were highly limited and focused on these worst case scenarios um, basically limited the range of options that were available and they likely also re-inscribed the stigma associated with divorce. Divorce effectively was being seen as generally unacceptable and only possible under very extreme conditions. Nevertheless, we can also see a new kind of figure emerging in the pages of Stri. A desperate but spirited woman, driven to seeking an education or a vocation, unsatisfied with just minimal economic support, and seeking an attractive companion and someone who could be an intellectual equal. You have been listening to BIC Talks by Bangalore International Center. If you like what you heard, do follow us on social media. Keep up with our programming by signing up for our mailer on the website or leave us a review or rating on Apple Podcasts or iTunes. The crew that makes these podcasts possible is Gaurav Krishna and Ishan Gupta on sound supervision and production with support from S. Sarunaraj and Raghu Tenkaila. 
artwork is designed by Chandni Venkataraman of Criss Cross Design Studio. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel on your favorite podcast platform. It can also be accessed on our website bangaloreinternationalcenter.org. This is Lekha Naidu signing off on behalf of everyone at BIC.